Hey, that's the eye clicker. Where's the slides? There's the slides. Okay, good. All right. So that was TCP. TCP is what you use for the vast majority of transmissions because if you're sending something, you want to make sure it really got there. However, sometimes you don't want that. As I mentioned, TCP is slow because you have to wait for all those acknowledgments. So you might have something like a security camera monitoring a parking lot, and you want it to just keep sending the data at full speed all the time. You don't want it stopping and resending because a packet got dropped. If a packet gets dropped, you'll just have a defect in the image and keep going. So that's the case for UDP, where you just send data. There is no handshake. There is no acknowledgment at all. You don't even know if it got there. You don't care. This is like broadcast television. They're playing Channel 3. They don't even know how many people have tuned in. They don't care. If you turn off your TV, they don't know or care. They just send it out in case anybody feels like watching it. Um, so this is a connectionless protocol, and they call it an unreliable protocol, which does not mean that it fails often. It means that you do not have receipts, so you do not know that it got there, the way you do with TCP. In practice, it probably got there because most network connections work pretty well, like more than 99% of the time, but you cannot prove that it got there. Yeah? Can you, can you explain what that means, uh, higher layer of TCP IP stack? Yeah, yeah. If you want, you can send reliable data over UDP if you build some kind of acknowledgement system at a higher level. And people do that. So, for example, if you send email, the email will bounce you. If it doesn't get there, it'll tell you it didn't get there. And that is not done at the TCP handshake. That's done at layer 7. There's a system where email that can't be delivered is sent back to you with a message. So you can add that in with uh, software at a higher level. So the internet layer is what finds the physical location of servers. Yeah? How right. is the application uh, confirming that uh, email is not sent? Uh, the application would have to send some kind of signal that did require response. So you could write something yourself where I can send and ask, did it get there? Or you can do what SMTP does, which is you send it, and if it doesn't reach the recipient, it will be sent back to you. So that's a clue, but that's not perfect, of course. Yeah, but you would have to consider all this in writing your own application instead of letting the uh, protocol do it for you. And some people do in special cases. Good. So ICMP is used to um, send signals about the network. The most common application is ping, just to see if a server is there. But it also is what's used to send error messages back and forth. If you send a packet to a router, and the router cannot forward that packet. For example, the router has a routing table. These addresses are that way. These addresses are that way. It might have, you might send it in a destination address that is not anywhere in its routing table which means the router does not have any paths to get there, so it will send a message back to you with ICMP, so you, I discarded your packet, dude, you might want to do something about that. If their router is busy and the queue is too long and it cannot handle any more data, it can send a package back saying, I discarded your, your packet for some other reason. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that goes over ICMP. But the most common thing is an echo request and an echo reply, like I was doing earlier. This was the standard way to map networks. Unfortunately, people used it for evil purposes so much that Microsoft blocked it with their firewall and Microsoft machines no longer answer pings by default. So there's, as the most common is an echo request type 8 and an echo reply type 0. There are other kinds of messages, but those are the most common ones. Um, so a ping, you just see a ping going out and a reply coming back in Wireshark with ICMP there. ICMP, echo request, echo reply. Very simple protocol. Um, only 74 bytes to send a ping and receive a reply. Um, yeah? Uh, eight was echo, zero was? Zero is the reply, I think, and eight's the request. Okay. I think that's how it goes, yeah. All right, and there's this warrior. How many people have not seen Warriors of the Net? How many people have seen it? Right, so three quarters of people are asleep. Uh, <laughs> anyway, because uh, you have to fit in one of those categories. Anyway, I think what I'll do is I'll play it after the lecture's over for people who want to see it. That's what I did in the Saturday class. If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. It's a movie that explains networking in an interesting sort of game type level. Uh, it's from old Cisco. I'll play it at the end of class. Anyway, so your IP addresses, uh, IP version 4, which is the predominant protocol in use on the internet, you're, you have 32-bit addresses. And the 32 bits, unfortunately, are broken into four decimal numbers. You, base 10 is evil, and we shouldn't have been, ever been using it. Base, this just gives everybody in the world headaches. So this number, like 147, 144, is a base 10 number that must be resolved into a 8 bits of binary, and that's why it can't get any bigger than 255, because 256 is a 9-bit number. So it looks like a decimal number, but it's really a binary number. 
And then you have dots in the middle, which are not decimal points in the usual sense. They're just separators for four fields, each of which has eight bits. So it's kind of screwy, but that's the way it is. Now, when the internet started, there was only one class. The first byte, the first number, like 147, determined the network, and the other three were to number devices on your network. So the entire internet could never have more than about 250 networks. And that seemed fine in the beginning, because the internet started, there were four servers on the internet, and they cost a million dollars each, and you didn't think there would ever be very many more. Nobody understood Moore's Law, which is very hard to understand and explain, how computers keep getting faster, and it never stops. Every other human technology, like fire and electricity, everything else, just hit a wall where it was as good as it was going to get, and then it didn't develop very fast after that. But computers are somehow immune to this, and they just keep getting fast at this insane rate, and it just keeps going on forever. Nobody can tell you why. There's never been anything in human history like this, where it keeps on getting better so fast for so long. Anyway, um, so, what's that? Well, well, communication only because of computers. If you go back farther, it, it kind of goes through a similar getting faster and faster arc, and then computers Does it? Do it, it? If you have our paper or something, I'd like to see it. Send me an email about it. I'd like, that's interesting. Maybe they, because I'd sort of like to understand what makes Moore's Law work. I suspect it's human psychology. It does not seem to be the technology, because um, I think it might be how fast humans can learn, but I don't know. Anyway, um, so then when the, they figured out the internet was going to be bigger than maybe 200 networks, they split it up into classful addressing. So the first half of it from 1 to 127, really 126, were class A. Those are the original networks that are huge. They have three bytes for the host, so they can have 16 million devices on their network, but the first byte is the byte that tells you where they are. These are where huge companies that have been in the game forever, like IBM, have them. Then, class B was half of what's left, 128 to 191, class C was half of what's left, 192 to 223, and class B, the first two bytes determine the network, and class C, the first three bytes determine the network, so there are many of them. And this made it possible to have about two million networks on the internet of various sizes. And that made it, uh, that was enough numbers to get us up to about 1990, 1981, I think, at this point. Then this system failed. I think it was 1993. I forget. I got the dates in one of my other classes. This system ended in, I think, 93, and they switched to CIDR, Classless Internet Domain Routing, where you can have any number of bits determine the network, and you have a slash number after it. But um, this system, you have to understand, even though it has been superseded, because many network devices are programmed using this system even though it's not what's not true on the internet anymore, that you have just these three classes. There are now technically 32 classes. Yeah? With IPv6, there's like, well, there's, so, there's, there's something in two, right? You so can have it in routing tables and such. Yeah, in IPv6, it... it, it, it you don't really need to do that, right? Uh, not as much. In IPv6, almost everything is always just a slice 64. The only ones that are really used much are slice 48 and slice 64, but the others do exist for huge organizations like ISPs. Anyway, so class A is where the first byte of the four bytes tells you what network you're on, and all the rest of the bytes tell you which specific device you're on. So that means the first byte is a network byte, and the others are called node bytes. So class B is where the first two bytes are network bytes, and the last two are node bytes. That's us, because City College is old enough that we got a distribution in the early times of the internet when class Bs were numerous, and they give it to us pretty easily. Now, our Class B address is worth a million dollars on the open market because IP version 4 addresses were all distributed in about 2012. They're all gone. They're a non-renewable resource. And you cannot get any fresh ones, so all you can do is get used ones from people that sell them, and they go for about $11 each now. I've been trying to sell ours for a couple of years, but they've seen me political issues about that. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the game there. Class C is the smallest and most common type of network to get where the first three bytes determine your network and you only have one byte for the node so you can only have 254 devices with separate public addresses on your network. That's usually enough for almost anybody. The college only has 30 public addresses because you only need to put it on your servers. Your workstations can have private addresses. Anyway, so that's the game here. Subnetting is determining uh, how much of this is network bits and how much of this is host bits. There's a thing called a subnet mask which is a binary number which has ones in the network portion and zeros in the host portion. So you can say a network byte and three host bytes, or you can say eight network bits and 24 host bits. And you can write the number with eight ones as 255. So these are all different ways of expressing the same concept. There are eight bits used to determine the network you're on, and the remaining bits, 24, are used to refer to the specific host. 
So that is called a slash eight in the modern cider notation. It has eight network bits. This has 16 network bits, the first two bytes determine it, like City College. This has 24 network bits. And now you can have other kinds of networks, like a slash 26 and a slash 17 and all that, which are different sizes in between the others. All right, and all this was done because they kept running out of addresses. They kept finding more and more efficient ways to cut up the addresses and not waste them. And eventually they ran out of them completely because there are only four billion addresses in the IPv4 space, and there's something like eight billion devices on the internet. So there's just not enough, and that's why we had to go up to IP version 6, where there's a much larger number of addresses. Anyway, um, so the subnet mask is the uh, indicator to your computer. You put it on your network card, and it tells it what portion of the address is the network portion. So um, here, for example, you can use your eye clickers for these. Um, I have to get my thing to start listening. All right, let me move this. Let's see, I think I can do this, that'll work, all right. So what's the network portion of that address? You got an IP address and a subnet mask. All right. I'll quit at 30 on this one. All right, it's 10. The first byte determines the network. Good, people know that. That's what you'd call a class A, although 10 is a private address, but it's in the range that you'd normally think of as class A in the old class, classical system. All right, what's the network portion of that address? All the routers outside your company only look at the network portion. That's all they care about. They use it to route to your company. The only people that care about the host portion are the internal devices on your network. Yeah? So um, in the network course, it talks about you know, here's your class A, B, and C yeah. um, networks, and in between is reserved for the loopback address. But like, right. What exactly is the purpose of the loopback? Uh, you have to be able to refer to yourself sometimes. For example, you can ping yourself as a diagnostic tool, and you can have things listening on the loopback address so they can only be connected from locally but not over the internet. That's a common security measure. So it turns out to be necessary to have a loopback address. Yeah, you're right. At first it would seem senseless. But it, in programming languages like Python, you have this thing called this, which turns out to be really useful, sort of like zero. These things at first seem senseless, and then it turns out to be pretty important to be able to refer back to yourself. That's just whatever host you're on. Right, okay. right. So if you listen on 127.001, you're listening on your own local network only, inside the device. And another process can connect inside the device, which is kind of screwy, Microsoft uses this very extensively since Vista. If you do netstat minus an on a Microsoft machine, you're listening on about 25 local ports. And I've tried and tried to get somebody to tell me what's going on with that, and I've not found anybody who can explain it to me in Microsoft. But they are using the network staff to inter-process communication in the same machine now for some reason. Yes? Yeah. So any kind of like address combination that begin with 127 is going to be a loopback. Yes, that was an enormous mistake. Yes, 127.00, actually most of them don't work, but in principle it's all reserved for loopback, so they burned 16 million addresses to make the loopback address in IP version 4. And when they ran out, that seemed like a poor decision. So in IP version 6, they used just one address, the lowest one possible, colon colon 1, is the loopback address. They didn't burn a whole range of addresses. But that was what seemed good to people, because the, they made the same mistake over and over and over with IP version 4. They thought that the internet was going to be small and it really didn't matter if you wasted numbers. And then they had to revise it to make more numbers, but they still didn't make enough. And then they had to revise it again to make more numbers because the internet just kept growing and growing and growing <laughs> beyond all the expectations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where, where's the pack actually going when it's leaving the host? Is it going to the router, the default gateway coming back? Is that it? No, if you want to get to the internet, um, and we'll have a diagram soon, but if, you, if you're going out to a local resource like your printer, it goes to the switch and the router and just back into your network. If you want to go to the internet, it goes to the router and then goes off to the internet. So when you're, when you're, when you're paying the uh, Yeah, when you're paying, if, if, I ping, if I ping the loop back, it never goes out the wire at all. It just goes to the so software on your machine and comes back. So it just goes to the NIC and comes right back? Yeah, it goes to the NIC and back. It doesn't even go out on the wire at all. Yeah, the loop back. Can you set it to go out? You'd have to ping an external address, like your router. You can then you go through the network to your router and back. Good? All right, anyway, this is, um, 
This one is the first two bytes, so it's why am I not seeing anything? Did it crash on me again? Hey, I seem to be having a lot of software problems today. Let's see if I can start listening again. Okay, I can do that. So now I can do this. Well, I should be able to go back to it, but it won't let me create it. All right, I'm going to close it and try resuming the session. I'm, uh, my software is hosing me today. I'm going to reboot it, and I'll bring the new uh, receiver next time, because I'm beginning to think this receiver has bit the dust. But I think I still can preserve your votes if I'm careful. Let's see. Choose. Resume. Resume. <laughs> and then go back one. Yeah, and now go back one. And there are the votes. And so 172.31 is the right answer. All right. We'll get through the day, and I'll try my new uh, receiver next time. So now I got another one like this, which is that one. What's the network portion? <coughs> These are the most common addresses in America. Linksys routers like to use the 192.168 addresses. Professor, so, so since you got 16, bitch, you could actually said slash cider notation 16, right? Uh, this is a slash 24. Okay. The previous one was a slash 16. Because okay. so it's 8 bits for each of these. So it's slash 24, okay. yeah. Because it's 24 bits, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. And I'll quit at uh, 35 here. Any more coming in? All right, so um, that's three bytes. Good, everyone's got it. All right, so now we are going to have a diagram that gets to exactly what people are starting to ask me there. Um, so let's talk about a network. So if you have a network, back in the old days, you'd have a hub, not a switch. That's the way people did things. And then you put manual addresses everywhere. This is the old fashioned network that you might have had. And you'd have, um, so you give the devices addresses like 192 and 68, 101, 102, and 103. And then each device has to have a subnet mask. And the subnet mask has to be the same on every device in your local area network. If it isn't, it won't work. Now, I mathematically, that bothers me because it seems to me like local, area network tra act, local network traffic should work, but I tried it with Windows XP and it didn't work. So anyway, you've got to have the same subnet mask everywhere. So this is a slash 24. The first three bytes determine the network and the last byte is what determines the host. So this computer gets 101, this is 102, this is 103 and that computer gets one. Now the computer at the top is the router, it's the gateway. So this computer has two network cards. It has one for the local area network and it has another one that goes to the internet. And the one that, now the one that goes on the local network can use these local addresses like 192.168 that are reserved for this purpose. They're reserved by RFC 1918, I think. And the result is you can never use them on the internet. If you send any packets to the internet with these private addresses, they will just be thrown away. They're not, so, you can use them for local traffic, but to get on the internet, you have to have a real public address so people can reply. So you have to pay a phone company or a cable company or something to rent an address. That's what you're doing. So this public address is 147, 144, 51, 1. That's the address of that other NIC. And that is the default gateway on this machine. This machine is the only machine that has connection to two networks. So if it gets a packet that is not on the local network, which it gets by doing an AND process on these two numbers, 192.168.1.0. If it starts 192.168.1, then it's on the local network and it doesn't need to go to the internet. If it starts with anything else, it gets forwarded to the default gateway and goes out the other network card to the internet. Anything down here, these clients all have to send their internet traffic to that machine, which will then forward it to the internet. And that's why each one of them has to have 192.168.1.1 as their default gateway. This system was opposed as unnecessarily complicated and giving everyone too many headaches when it started, and people much preferred to use things like Apple Talk on their local network that was very simple and NetBIOS, but this is the one that won on the internet, and after everybody got on the internet, they all used this for local traffic too, because since you have to learn it, why would you use two protocols? So, I got a few, um, we'll talk about problems here. If you give two computers the same address, 192.68.1.101, what will happen is, if you're using Windows XP and you do this, then the first computer will go on fine, and when you turn on the second computer, it will pop up an error message on this and that screen, and this one will be kicked off the network saying you can't use the same address twice. Vista would not notice that. They took away the gratuitous art that did this, and in practice, you can actually do it, and what happens is each of them loses half the packets. And since TCP resends them, you can actually do it and it kind of works, which is really messed up, but you're not supposed to do that. 
but you can kind of do it. It's not recommended. Anyway, uh, it's a bad idea to have identical numbers here. It's also a bad idea to have identical phone numbers in a phone network because you don't know which phone to ring. It's the same issue. So um, you can't use the same address twice. Um, you can't give it an address that's outside the subnet. If all these are 192.168.1 and the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 and I give this a 192.168.2, then it's not on the same network as the other devices and it won't be able to send or receive any packets onto that network. If you want to move from one network to another, you have to use a router. You can't just use a hub. So this machine will be kicked off, will be unable to send or receive any traffic on the network. Um, if you put the wrong subnet mask down here, it won't be able to send or receive anything in practice, and I don't really understand why. Yeah? So there's a computer A, like a router? Yeah, that's the router. That's why it's the one that connected to two networks, and it's going to have routing turned on. And in the early days, people actually used computers for routers. Nowadays, they mostly buy special little devices. Um, What's the responsibility of subnet, like, What's that? Responsibility of subnet. What about it? Responsibility. What's the responsibility? Like, what does it do? Uh, the subnet mask tells this computer how big the local network is. So this one thinks the local network is everything including 192.168 followed by anything, but this one thinks the local network is 192.168.1. And that seems like a small difference, but the effect of it is this computer won't be able to send or receive anything into this network. Um, yeah? Since this is a hub, yeah. does it matter if there's a subnet or not because it's just sending it out on? Uh, All ports, right? Yes. So the Ethernet will work, but the IP layer won't work. You won't oh. be able to reach the addresses. So if you were to send something like an Ethernet broadcast, it would work. You'll be in the line. You'll yeah. Be so you can send like a DHCP broadcast, but you won't be able to send any directed traffic to IP because the IP layer so won't you can't work. Leave right. the, the network. And in this case, you can't even reach the other machines on the LAN with the Sydney subnet. All right, and you can also have the wrong default gateway. If you put the wrong gateway down here, then this machine will be able to talk to local resources, like a shared printer or a file share over here, because the local networking is fine, but if it tries to go on the internet, it will send its internet traffic to machine B, which is not the router, and will just throw it away. So this guy will not be able to get his email. But it, won't, it will be able to reach local resources. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff that happens. So I just have some puzzles here, and there's an extra credit project uh, where you find the problem with various networks. Um, so here's one find the problem, and just say which machine has a problem here, A, B, C, or D? Uh, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> All right. So, uh, I guess I'll uh, wait till 40. I think we have at least 30 voters. All right, so the problem is D, and most people found it. Um, D has got the wrong IP address. D has got an IP address of 192.68.11, which is the address of the gateway, and so this one is gonna have an address conflict. Now, you might think you could change that one, but it's already put in as the default gateway everywhere. So that's right, and this is wrong. There's a problem with D's IP address. So yeah. what's going to happen in that case? What will happen is, assuming this one was turned on first, when this guy turns on the machine, he'll just get an error message, and he won't be able to network at all. Of course, we're using static addresses here. If you use DHCP, the address is all controlled by the server, and this kind of thing would never happen. Yeah? Where's the DHCP server located, like, on your machine, or is it like something? No, it's typically in the router. That's what yeah. Right. What's that? Oh, if you, uh, I haven't tried it, and you'd have to see. I would imagine, usually Linux does things right, <laughs> so it probably does a gratuitous ARP, which is what it's supposed to do. Before you can use an address, it does an ARP request to see if someone's using that address, and if you are, it'll just pop up an error message and not let you on. That's what should happen, and that's probably what Linux does, but I have not tested it. But especially in networking stuff, Linux tends to do things right and obey the rules. Microsoft tends not to. But in the modern version of Microsoft, they do better. Yeah? Uh, just to take a step back, the, uh, the default gateways of these, B, C, and D, yeah. uh, they connect to the computer A, yes. which is the router. Yes. And uh, 
That's what they should do. And the 147.144 connects yeah. to the bigger interface. Right, to bigger. That's why this one, its default gateway tells it to use its other network card. It's the only one that has two network cards, and that's the one represented by the diagonal line. That's right. So that one has a gateway that goes to the real internet. These ones have a gateway that go to the local router, which then forwards to the real internet. Okay, good. And so the anyway, the answer to this one was D. We've already graded it. Good. Let's try again. All right. What's wrong with this one? Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, looks like I can quit at 35. All right, and that's D again. Good, everybody got it. That subnet mask is ridiculous. All ones, you can't send or receive any packets with a subnet mask like that. You have to have some network portion and some host portion, or it doesn't make any sense. All right, what's wrong with this one? So I'll quit at 40. All right. And so this one here has a 0, 192.168.0, but all the rest are 8. And up there it tells you you're supposed to use 192.168.8, so it's B that has a address outside the subnet. Okay, good. So B will not be able to send or receive any traffic. All right. Okay. What's can that? He send, he send uh, no, because he cannot reach 192.168.8 because it's not on his local area network. His network is 192.168.0 with the 255.255.255, so he cannot address this. It's on a separate network. So he can't get to the gateway. All right. Good. Yeah. Can we just walk through that last part it slowly? So, uh, because that part is zero. Yep, then, then his local network, all the addresses on his local network start 192.168.0. And he can't reach any other network without going through a router. But the router is at 192.168.8.1. So he can't reach the router. He would need another router to lift him off the 192.168.0 network and put him on the 192.168.8 network to get to the router. And you could, if you put another router in here, then he could be on a different network. But if he's connected to a hub, the hub is not able to reach it. Now the Ethernet will go through, but the IP addresses will not work. And, it, and if you really want to understand it, it'd be cool to set it up and like run Wireshark and see what happens. Anyway, good. So uh, what's wrong with this one? Good. Looks like I guess I can quit at 35. Looks like people mostly found it. All right. B is all messed up. B has got the same address as its gateway, so B is not going to be able to reach the internet. He can reach local things like the shared printer, but B is not getting anywhere with default gateway and its own address. Equal anything it tries to send off the internet will just be going around and around in circles, getting nowhere. All right, and this last one, what's wrong with this? Oh, all right.
All right, looks like I can quit it. I guess 40, 45, I guess. All right, A has got the wrong address, and everybody sees it ends in 11 instead of 1, so nobody can get on the internet. The router has the wrong address, and that means there's no way off of this network for any of those poor guys. All right, um, now I got a few more things here. Uh, this, oh, those are the answers. All right, and IP version 6 is the new hotness. IP version 6 has long addresses like this, 2001C083700. It's hexadecimal, there's no base 10 anywhere which is your best friend after you get used to it. And this is four times longer. It's 128 bits instead of 32 bits, so it is unthinkably huge. There are enough addresses that we will not run out of them anytime soon. Um, and that's the idea. It also means the addresses are getting awfully long to remember and write in, so you pretty much want to use domain names and such to do it. Um, and there used to be a whole class in IPv6, but people lost interest. Um, anyway, it is the the most everything is moving to it. I think Google now has about 20% of its traffic on IPv6 and other people measure up to 50% of their traffic running over IPv6 these days. Um, so this IPv4 is very slowly fading and IPv6 is coming up and within 15 or 20 years IPv4 may be deprecated and stop working. But right now we have a gigantic established infrastructure of IPv4 devices that still work. So we're going to continue to have both IPv4 and IPv6 for like the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Each portion of that is, uh, uh, what, 8 bits? Or no, oh, uh, each, each IPv6 has these <coughs> fields, and each one of them is 16 bits. Each, each character is 4 bits. And by the way, um, in case, I, I should mention this. Um, in fact, I'm going to put it at the bottom of the page. It's not worth credit in this class, but if you need to learn binary, then um, let me just put up my binary games. I've got them from an old class, uh, 120, and I'm going to add them to this class in case there are people that don't know binary. Like I say, you will just continue to be humiliated until you learn binary, so you might as well, sooner or later you'll have to bite the bullet and learn your binary if you're going to be in this business. Um, and my plan was people learn it in an earlier class, but I'm going to put this here at the bottom of the 123 page so you can try them if you like. And um, let me just point it out. Let me refresh this page. And here's the binary games. I just wrote these uh, just to try to entertain people, make it more fun to learn it. And the point is, you can learn in steps. So the first thing is nibbles. And that's all I'm going to show you today. But in fact, I'll do a bit of this and see if everybody knows it. Uh, there's an iClicker version, which, uh, is it this? It is. Cool. Okay. So, um, fact, here we are, we might as well try it, because you guys should know your binary. So, this is thinking PDF, but maybe I can make it work. All right, so in base 10, you have normal numbers. 147 means 100 and 4 tens and 7. That's how it works. So the plan is the number on the right is 1s, the next thing is 10 to the 1, the next thing is 10 to the 2. That's how it works. And in base, that's the plan of base 10, which we've all gotten used to. Base 2 does it with only two numbers, 0 and 1. And so the number on the right, 1, 1, is 3, because the number on the right is the number of 1s, and the next number is the number of 2s. All right. So if you write down 1, 0, 1, the one on the left is 4s, the one in the middle is 2, and the one on the right is 1. So this is 4 plus 1, that is 5. So if you count to 7, it looks like this. 0 is 0, 1, 0 is 2, 1, 1, 1 is 7. Because it's 4 plus 2 plus 1. And if you make a nibble, nibble is half of a byte. It's 4 bits. And so it's, there's 1s, 2s, 4s, and 8s, and that's all there is. So this is 9, 1, 8, and 1, 1, and nothing else. So those are all the nibbles. The highest nibble is 1, 1, 1, 1, which is 15. And by the way, one that's easy to remember is that 10, 10 is 10. Okay. It's 8 plus 2. And this helps. And if you get used to this, uh, you, um, I think, do I have hex here? I think I don't have hex in this one. All right, we'll get to hex. But anyway, those are your nibbles. So let me just see if you people can do nibbles. I've got a game of nibbles. And there we are. So it's the iClicker version. So let me just start the thing listening. 1001, convert it to decimal, 
and uh, choose the right letter. All right, and I guess I'll quit at 30. All right, so that's nine. Good, everybody knows that. I was hoping so. All right. So let me try one or two more of these to see if I'm convinced you people have got it. That's nine. All right, how about that one? One thousand. What is it in decimal? Of course, it's not one thousand. It's one zero zero zero. There is no, there is no English lexicographic way to express these things unfortunately, because our language only handles base 10. I'll quit at 30. All right, that's eight. Hopefully everybody got that. Good, everybody got that. All right, then let me go ahead to the hex and make sure everybody's comfortable with that. It's only a small step forward. So um, here is hex. All right, so hex is where you just take the list of nibbles and you make it into one letter. So 10 you call A and 11 is B and 12 is C and so on. So now you have one letter that stands for four bits. This is the greatest way to do it. This makes it easy to convert between binary and decimal in your head. And you do get used to this after a while, so things like 9 plus 1 is A, and things like A, C, and E are even, but F, D, and B are odd. You get used to this stuff until you can read it just like base 10. And uh, so that's the four bits. Uh, now a byte, which is two bits. There's a really hard way to do bytes, where you add up like 128 plus 64 plus 32. Base 10 is evil, just forget it. Base hex is better. In hex, you have a nibble here and a nibble there. So every byte is two characters long. And you can just read it. The 1001, this is 9. 1001, that is 9. This number is 99 nine, nine hex. You don't add 130, 128 and 64 or any of that hogwash. You just read the left four bits and the right four bits, and that's it. That's why everybody puts hex in source code and Wireshark packet captures and just everywhere. It is the cool way to write down binary numbers so you can read them and use them. So this number, if you do it the super hard way, you take 128 plus 16 plus 8 plus 1, and that's 153. But that is for losers. The right way to do it is that this number is 9-9. Nine nine. Because that's 9 and this is 9, so it's 9-9. Nine nine. And if you want it in base 10, this is 9 sixteens plus 9, the two-digit number. The left number is the number of sixteens, the right number is the number of ones. So you never add 128 and 32 and 16 and all that stupid stuff. You just have the number of sixteens over here and the number of ones over there. So let's see if you can do that. And that's here. So 9 in hex is just 9? Mm, yes. Thanks. But 9 zero in hex is 9 sixteens. Not nine tenths. So let me go back to the last name. So this is this number is nine nine in hex. So this is the number of ones and this is the number of sixteens. So it's not ninety nine. It's one hundred and fifty three. It's nine sixteens plus nine, not nine tenths plus nine. That's why you put a zero x in front of it to remind you this is hexadecimal. This is the number sixteen. That's the number of ones. All right, good. Let's see if you can do a couple of them. How about that? There's a binary number. Now, I put a space in the middle of my binary number, which is non-standard, but it makes it easier to see. So what is that number in hex? Nope, I guess smaller is better. All right. All right, I'm going to quit at 30. All right, that number is 3, which is E. Good, everyone got it. All right, because there's nothing but zeros, just two ones on the right. That's good old 3. All right, how about this one in hex? Okay, good. I 
guess I'll quit at 35. Now this can actually take like a minute and a half if people are adding 128 and 64, but hopefully none of you are doing that. <laughs> uh, um, all right. You just read them. 1000 is 8. 1100 is C. It's 8C. A popular answer. You just read it off. You don't multiply anything. The left four bits are this nibble. The right four <coughs> bits are that nibble. If you know a nibble, you know a byte. Yeah? So, it's not, so the first... First one is 8. Oh no, I'm saying, so the first letter is 10. The first letter is the number of 16s. But anyway, the first thing so here is 8421. So yeah. In the, in the right hand side of the device, the first letter that you're actually going to use that's not 9 is going to be 10, right? And that's what that would be A. Like that would be A. And that would be 1010. 10, 10 is 10. Count up from that. Yeah, you can. Also, I, you can just do it this way 8 plus 4 is 12. And then 10, 11, 12 is A, B, C. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And when you're starting, you can even make a little chart, like on a piece of paper. Yeah, so it's H C. That's what I actually had to think through a couple times because sometimes I miss and hit D or B. But it helps to learn that C is even and E is even. Because even numbers end in zero and odd numbers end in one. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Let's try another one. How about that one? All right. Quit at 30, I guess. Looks like people are a little faster, which is good. All right, and that is 4C, so it's A. And unanimous, that's what I like to see, everybody's getting it. One more of these, and I think that's enough for today. Um, oh, I have a demonstration to give you. All right, but that's, okay, that's good. All right. Good. Yeah, I click her. Okay, where are yours? Over here. Okay. Uh, I'll make a note of that. You get one point because you didn't get a fair chance to win. Well, at the end, come and give me your name, and I'll I'll put it there. But anyway, the, all right. Let me. Um, I think I'm going to quit here. I'll quit at 45. There are many answers I'm going to get. People seem a little confused about this one. 10, 10 is 10, that's A, and this is 5. So it's A5, which is C. Good, most people got it. All right, um, now what I want to do, I have two things on the agenda. One is I want to demonstrate the first project, the second project rather, make sure you know what you're doing because not too many people have done the projects yet. And then I also want to play that movie, but I'll do that at the very end so people that want to can just go to the lab if you don't care about that movie. But if you haven't seen it, it is worth seeing at least once. Um, anyway, let me make a note of who won the eye clickers, uh, at least the numbers right now, and then I can demonstrate the project. So here are the winners, the 18s and the 17s, quite a few. I'll take just the 18s. So it's 31, 29, 65, 51, and 64. So if you won, don't go running away and take your name out of the box before I get your name. But um, let me just show you the projects because I want people to be reminded to do them. Now one thing worth knowing is that the scores are published. So if you go to the top of this, here are all the scores. The last four digits of your student ID are here and here's what you've done. And as you see, a couple of people have done project one and that's it. On the other hand, somehow a whole lot of people have done lock picking. So that's good. Anyway, so that's what we've done so far, as you know. Everybody lock picking, most other people haven't started doing their homework yet, which is okay, but in order to encourage you, I want to demonstrate it. So 123 projects. Um, first one, you just get your virtual machines working. So I'll get mine up. You get your Windows machine running, and you get your Kali Linux machine running. So when you have two virtual machines running, the first problem people often have is getting them to talk to each other. There are several different networking modes. The most important ones are NAT and Bridged. NAT 
causes VMware to simulate a router and assign private addresses to each thing. NAT is safer because the virtual machines are separated from the host and from the rest of the network you're connected to. One time I went to a coffee house and I was in bridged mode and I started doing attacks and I was affecting all the machines in the room. And that's kind of rude and sort of illegal and just not a good thing to do. So NAT mode is safer in that regard. Um, anyway, all that matters for the project to succeed is they have to be the same. If you put one in bridged mode, which means it connects directly to the network, and the other in NAT mode, then they can't see each other because one's behind the router and the other isn't. Right now, this is in NAT mode, and this is in NAT mode, so they should be able to see each other. So if I run IP config in the Windows machine, I can see 172.16.1.129. 1, That's my address. So before you even try to do a project, ping from one machine to another because people very often have networking problems and there's no point trying to do anything until you get the networking working. So before you even think about anything else, just try the ping. Um, yeah? If you're using VirtualBox, uh, is it the same idea? What's that? If you're using VirtualBox? Yeah, VirtualBox is similar. Yeah, you have the same kind of modes. Um, they, I think it's in a slightly different place in the menu, but it's the same principle, yeah. Um, all the virtual software does approximately the same thing. So where, in which, uh, where should we look for it? What's that? Uh, in, where in the settings? In the um, it's in the machine settings. And there's a, it, menus are a little different, but it's there. It's in the network card settings. Yeah. It has yeah. to be a Windows 10? Can it be a Windows 7? Oh, any kind of Windows will do. And any kind of Linux will do, too. Although, um, for this one, you have to pretty much have Kali because it has you need Armitage. Okay. So now I'm going to try pinging that machine. I was hoping I could fit its address on the screen at the same time as the other one. Ah, uh, there. Now I might be able to do it. There we are. So ping 172.16.1.129. All right. So I get replies. That's good. You have to press Control C or Linux will ping forever. So now I can ping the machine. Now in this project, you start Armitage. Let me bring up the instructions and just point it out. Armitage is a tool kind of intended for like high school students and beginning hackers to be fun. It's a graphical tool to take over machines. It's, um, there's a professional tool called Cobalt Strike that comes on after it that makes it look like a video game and you can take over hundreds of machines. And the guy that wrote it is dresses like the guy from the Matrix with the long trench coat. And he really thinks he should teach high school students to hack. It's his big cause. I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, it's a good project. It's a good product. And it makes it fun to hack things. So you go to your Kali machine and you start it with these two commands, um, msdb init and armitage. If it fails, which it often does, because for some reason when they upgraded Kali to Kali 2, they broke armitage and they never seem to fix it. Every time I contact them, they, they say, oh, we fixed it last week, but it still doesn't work. So anyway, if it doesn't work, you'll have to execute all these commands to download and install armitage. But anyway, when you're, if you've done that, um, you'll be able to start it here. All right. And so I'm going to paste those in to my Kali machine. So msfdb init, it's already been done. Armitage starts this glorious tool named Armitage. It has to connect to an internal server, and then it has to connect to a Metasploit RPC session. So these are those local connections we were talking about, listening on 127.001. Three processes are running on my machine, talking to each other through network ports, that don't go anywhere, that go to other ports on the same machine. But this thing is Armitage, and it gives you a sort of graphical interface that looks like a video game. I'm going to remove this. Um, I can figure out how. Remove. Good. All right. Because I want to scan for it and show you how long it takes. There. OK. So you start with this. You don't see anything. Be and the first thing you have to do is scan your network. So it's hosts, nmap scan, intent scan would be fine. Um, and so you put in a range. Now, you could scan the whole network, all 256 hosts, but it would just slow you down. Since I know what I want to attack, I'm just going to scan that one machine, 172.16.1.129. 1, now, since he said use a slash 24 there, I usually put a slash 32 here, which means just that one address. I don't know if you have to put that there. It might be OK to omit it. But anyway, this will scan that one machine. I click OK. And the way it works is it runs Nmap, and it shows you the Nmap down here. So it's finding open ports on the machine and so on. And yeah. And you can do this all manually through the command line? You can you know do the Nmap scan manually, but the rest of it is going to be harder to do manually. You can principally, this is all just, you can do it all with Metasploit to the command line. But the attacks, you have the command lines get kind of long. 
And all this does is do a graphical interface to type in the Metasploit commands for you. Gotcha. Yeah? What about when you get an R host error? Have you come R up with that? R host? Yeah. Just when you do the scan, it just shows up as a plus. Uh, it's not picking up the, um, yep. it's picking up the, the server 20, 2008 thing. Really. Yeah, well, I don't know. But the first thing is ping it if you can't find it. Um, and by the way, uh, I'll show you another trick too. But it, when it, so now it's, it's still, it does a scan, and in a few seconds it finds some open ports, but then it does a service detection where it sends a lot of traffic, and that takes like two or three minutes. So it has received some responses here, and notice, by the way, it found 21 open. 21 is FTP. And um, now notice it's getting a bunch of problems with 21. It's holding up the scan. This is very common. The reason why this machine is hackable is because it's running an old crappy product called Easy FTP Server. And it's junk and it crashes all the time. So if you get a bunch of error messages about port 21, which is very common, or everything just fails, so you click OK, see it found it, but it did not detect the operating system because it was having problems with port 21. So I can use it this way, but to fix it, when you, I'm not going to be able to hack into it because the FTP server has crashed. So when you have problems, you just restart. Easy FTP service, restart. It needs to be restarted pretty often because it's a piece of junk. That's why we're going to hack machines through it. It's old, crappy, open source software. And in addition to being vulnerable, it actually doesn't work very well. Bauer, if you have a pro another thing you can try to make sure it's working is you can connect through a command line. So I go here and just open a terminal. I can do, um, I should have a ping up here. Nope, not here, all right. Um, I need the IP address again. There it is, all right. So I can do a netcat to that address, 172.16.1.129 on port 21. And if it works, I'll see big fool cat FTP server. That's what you want. It sounds kind of stupid, because it is junk. But that's the point. If, you, if it had crashed, I wouldn't get that banner. You need to see that banner or the project won't work. The FTP server is running, and the FTP server has a vulnerability. So to exploit it, you just search for it here, Easy FTP, and it will show you the Easy FTP attacks that are available. There's one, there's various attacks. I think they'll all work. I usually use the first one, CWD fix ret, um, change working directory has a vulnerability. So you drag the attack, you drop it on your target. It now is ready to attack the target. Now you find out that there are different versions of the attack, and we are using the latest and greatest version of Easy FTP Server, which is the 11th revision, and it's still crap. And we now can attack it. That's all you have to do is choose the right version and launch. And now, down here, it shows you progress as it runs Metasploit to attach it. It's sending an exploit buffer. It's got a session open, and now I get lightning bolts. I now own the box. The lightning bolt means I own that box. So since I own the box, I can do rotten things to it. I can right click, go to my interpreter session, and now I can explore the box. I can look at the processes, for example. It will show me the running processes on that machine. These are the Windows processes on the machine. So I can see if it's running antivirus or something. Maybe I'd like to terminate the antivirus process. I can go to my interpreter, interact, uh, explore. I can do screenshot. And it will give me a copy of the desktop. Here's the desktop with that Windows environment. I can record key presses. Um, I can enter, I can, ex come on, explore, log keystrokes. Okay, keystroke recorder, launch. And now this guy is typing in stuff. Let's open notepad and say, um, typing in stuff. And there it is. So this is how you steal people's passwords. You, you can turn on the webcam and take pictures. You can make a video. This is why you keep tape over your webcam, because it's very easy to do. Any of you can do it. Yeah? So when you look at the Metasploit, yeah. it's there. It's like, I've opened it before, and I've seen you, know, you can get like 50 of those, and they all have names kind of like that, which don't make much sense. Is there a way to like 50 what? choose? Like oh yes, that's if you use like there's a, a hail mary where you just send everything, and then you get like 50 sessions. Is there a resource to like actually look at each of those exploits and know like what the? Yes, a lot of the exploits have a test mode where it will tell you if it's vulnerable, um, and there are other tools like vulnerability scanners. 
that will just tell you if it's vulnerable. And then if you were if you wanted to be more subtle, you would carefully try to one by one and use the one that because of course the Hail Mary thing will get you caught if they have any kind of intrusion detection. But it'll just you don't want to get in, it'll get you in a hurry. So that's the game here. And what you do in this project is then you turn on a defense here, a Microsoft defense which blocks buffer overflows and it makes your machine safe again. It prevents this attack. So that's what I wanted to show you. That's what it should look like when you get this project working. And so uh, I'm going to stop the recording and then I will um, uh, play that video. So let me save this as 123 chapter 2B. Thank <coughs> you.